Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button and the YouTube subscribe button. April 7th is Daniel Ellsberg's 90th birthday. Ellsberg is the original whistleblower, the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers and helped end the Vietnam War. Henry Kissinger called him the most dangerous man in America, but not, as we have mistakenly believed for many years, because he was about to pull back the curtain on U.S. policies in Vietnam. Kissinger was terrified that Ellsberg was about to reveal an altogether different set of papers, the other Pentagon papers, ones that would reveal the extent and sheer madness of U.S. nuclear war plans to the public. Dan Ellsberg was born in Chicago in 1931. After graduating from Harvard in 1952 with a BA summa cum laude in economics, he studied for a year at King's College, Cambridge University on a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. Between 1954 and 1957, Ellsberg spent three years in the U.S. Marine Corps, serving as a rifle platoon leader, operations officer, and rifle company commander. 1959, Ellsberg became a strategic analyst at the Rand Corporation and a consultant to the Defense Department and the White House, specializing in problems of the command and control of nuclear weapons, nuclear war plans, and crisis decision-making. His book, Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, revealed what he called the institutional madness of American nuclear war planning. Edward Snowden said, this long-awaited chronicle from the father of American whistleblowing is both an urgent warning and a call to arms to a public that has grown dangerously habituated to the idea that the means of our extinction will forever be on a hair-trigger alert. Ellsberg's book exposes much of the mythology that was the basis of the Cold War with the Soviet Union and was used to justify the creation of a massive military industrial complex. In 1967, Ellsberg worked on a top secret study with Defense Secretary McNamara, U.S. decision making in Vietnam, 1945 to 68, which later came to be known as the Pentagon Papers. In 1969, he photocopied the 7,000 page study and gave it to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In 1971, he gave it to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and 17 other newspapers. Ellsberg's subsequent trial on 12 felony counts, posing a possible sentence of 115 years, was dismissed in 1973 on the grounds of governmental misconduct against him, leading to the convictions of several White House aides and figuring in the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon. Ellsberg's release of the Pentagon Papers was an important contribution to the pressure on Nixon to end the Vietnam War. Now joining us to talk about the Extraordinary Life of Daniel Ellsberg is historian Peter Kuznick. Peter is a professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He's the author of Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists as Political Activists in the 1930s America. He and filmmaker Oliver Stone co-authored the 12-part Showtime documentary film series and book, both titled The Untold History of the United States. Thanks very much for joining me, Peter. Glad to be with you, Paul. So th this is uh, Daniel 90th birthday, and I have to say, he's still active as hell and still uh, campaigning against nuclear weapons and speaking out on so many issues. Um, and I, I wish I had his energy uh, now, never mind at 90. Um, but let's, let's start with the issue of uh, Dan's role as a nuclear war planner and, and what he re has revealed over the years about American nuclear war strategy and the significance of it. Well, Dan first learned about the possibility of atomic bombs when he was 13 years old from one of his middle school teachers who warned that theoretically it is possible to make an atomic bomb. This was before Hiroshima. And from that point on, Dan was very, very worried about the prospect of doing so. Once the bombs were detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, his fears were confirmed. Uh, he, at Harvard, he was actually studying economics. And in his graduate studies, he studied decision theory, especially decision-making 
in a situation where there was a lot of ambiguity. Uh, and uh, that's what his PhD dissertation was on. He entered, went to work for the Rand Corporation after his years in the Marines because he wanted to work on problems of preventing a nuclear war. You have to remember, he starts really working there in 58, and then gets permanently on board in 59. And at that point, especially in the aftermath of the Soviets launching Sputnik in late 1957, October of 57, Americans assumed that the Soviets had an advantage in terms of intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Soviets had actually tested their first ICBM before Sputnik. In the late 50s, there was a lot of discussion about the missile gap, the idea that the Soviets not only had an advantage, but they could launch a preemptive strike. You might remember the Gaither Report, and the Gaither Report warned that the U.S. is in the worst peril of our existence that the Soviets could launch a, nuke, a first strike on the United States that could effectively wipe the United States out. Uh, so when Kennedy got, gets elected in 1960, Kennedy had run in part on the basis of this missile gap, which most people believe to be true. Kennedy takes office and he quickly finds out that there is no missile gap. Then he gets McNamara to continue the study and we soon discover that there is a missile gap, but the United States has a vast advantage. The United States is ahead in most categories of at least 10 to 1, in some categories of 100 to 1 over the, uh, over the Soviet Union. Dan, at that point, was working at, on McGeorge Bundy's staff. So he'd been with the Rand Corporation. It was now working with McGeorge Bundy, uh, was in the Defense Department, and <clears throat> he was assigned to do several things that were quite important. One was he wrote the speech for Roswell Gilpatrick that basically lays out <clears throat> the, uh, the, the reality of the missile gap, the one which they admit publicly how far ahead we were. And he saw that as a way to warn the Soviets uh, not to do anything extreme because the United States had this capability, which, of course, Khrushchev already knew. Uh, the, the, but he also then for McBundy, for George Bundy, uh, posed certain questions to the Pentagon, which people did not know before. And the main question he posed was how many people would be killed in a U.S. nuclear attack? It was delivered by Bob Comer in the name of President Kennedy. And the Pentagon responded in two parts. The first part talked about how many Russians and Chinese would be killed. The second part talked about how many people overall would be killed. And what, what Dan discovered in this response was that the Pentagon estimated that between 275 million and 325 million Russians and Chinese would be killed from America's weapons. Then they, we also found out that 100,000 uh, West Europe, Europeans would be killed 100,000 um, in the surrounding countries, uh, overall, the total was going to be 600 million dead from America's attack alone, which means that to Dan, uh, 100 holocausts as a result from America, because America's plan at that point was to shoot off our entire arsenal at one time. There was no plans for a gradation, no plans for a limited response, a gradual response, it was to shoot it all off at once. So at least 600 million, partly depending on certain wind effects. Uh, so that was terrifying to Dan. And that does not even include the effects of Soviet weapons uh, in their targets in Europe and the United States. Dan at that point did not know about nuclear winter or because he would have realized that almost everybody on earth would have been killed from that kind of mass detonation. But Dan soon starts to discover other things because he becomes the leading expert on command and control of nuclear weapons. And what he discovers over the next of this period is, first of all, there is no longer just one finger on the nuclear button as 
people had believed that they were actually, that Eisenhower had delegated authority to the theater commanders to use nuclear weapons if Eisenhower, if the president were incapacitated or if they thought it was necessary and they were out of communication. What Dan had discovered was, in some of his other studies during this time was that, that these commanders were out of communication with the White House and the Pentagon often hours a day partly because of weather conditions, partly because cables got cut. So uh, this idea that the president was the only one who could authorize the use of nuclear weapon was a falsehood that Dan understood. Then he also understood that Eisenhower gave them the authority uh, to subdelegate this same authority. So if the, the heads of the numbered armies and air forces, for example, or others in the field, uh, were out of touch with their commanders and they thought it was necessary to launch, then they had the authority to launch also under certain circumstances. So what Dan realized is that there was not one finger on the nuclear button. There were probably at least dozens, maybe scores of fingers on the nuclear button. Beyond that, I mean, it, it kept on getting worse. Beyond that, he understood that America's policy at this point, especially in NATO, was to not only threaten to launch, but actually if European countries were being threatened, the United States could launch a preemptive attack against the Soviet Union and later against China. Which, which, which would wipe out much of Europe. Which would, it was suicidal. <laughs> Dan, Dan understood the insanity of this. That's why when he talks about the doomsday machine, he means it quite literally. He means that our, in the rationale, the thinking behind our nuclear strategy, which was the heart of our defense policy that we built up into this vast machine, because what, you know, and I put a lot of this in untold history and much of which I learned from Dan and that when Eisenhower took office, we had approximately a thousand nuclear weapons and they were in the hands of the civilians. But Eisenhower quickly starts transferring them to the military control. And when Eisenhower's budgeting cycle is finished, not his budgeting cycle, when his presidency is finished in January of, of uh, 1961, we now have uh, no longer uh, a thousand, we now have close to 23,000 nuclear weapons. When Eisenhower's budgeting cycle is finished, the United States has 30,000 nuclear weapons. So Eisenhower's warning about the military industrial complex was not a metaphor, you know, it was not an abstraction. Eisenhower knew this because he had created the military industrial complex. And for the crazy reason that he was afraid that by unbalancing the budget, that we would run this huge deficit and that would wreck the American economy. And he thought that nuclear weapons were cheaper than convention, conventional weapons. And so he downplayed the army, tried to control the, the defense budget, and to do so with the cheaper means of defending the United States with nuclear weapons. But it's a beginning of this total insanity, which consists, consists of, uh, to this day. And that's what Dan's dedicated his life to combating, the realization <laughs> that we've created this insane doomsday machine that's not only irrational and indefensible, it is suicidal. And so much of this uh, nuclear war mythology, which the missile gap is one of the big pieces of, is a foundation of the whole uh, rationale, justification for the military industrial complex. And so much of it is just bullshit. <laughs> and, and, and apparently Kennedy was told this while he was campaigning for president. Is that true? He was told there really wasn't a missile gap, but he keeps saying it as part of his election campaign. Is that right? I don't think so. Um, uh, Alsop was the one who was advising Kennedy on this, and the numbers he was giving him were totally insane. Uh, but also the same thing with the demands from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, and uh, the Strategic Command. I mean, they wanted... 3,000 more ICBMs. McNamara said the lowest number he could uh, 
convince them to accept with the increase of a thousand ICBMs. Now, how did that look to the Soviets? How did that look to the Kremlin? They knew that the United States had a vast superiority already. And so the United States was going to add a thousand more intercontinental ballistic missiles to the arsenal. In the Kremlin, they were convinced that the United States was preparing for a first strike, that there'd be no other reason if they had such a vast superiority already to massively increase the number of ICBMs unless they're preparing for a strike. And they were. And, well, they had plans to do so. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy thought it was absolutely insane. When Kennedy was briefed upon this, he commented to Dean Rusk, and we call ourselves the human race. You know, Kennedy hated this, as did Khrushchev, and we're very lucky. Kennedy once said, I'd rather my children be red than dead. The opposite of Eisenhower, who said, I'd rather be atomized than communized. Had Eisenhower had been in, in office during the Cuban Missile Crisis, instead of Kennedy, we wouldn't be here today having this discussion. Mm. Had Barack Obama been in office instead of Kennedy, we wouldn't be ha having this discussion. We are lucky that probably the only president who would have resisted during the Cuban Missile Crisis, who of any president we've had since Roosevelt, was Kennedy. All right, let's hold the Obama piece, because that's rather interesting. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get back to that. My understanding is uh, in this period, which I guess is around 1960 or just after Kennedy gets elected, um, that the Army and Navy were saying that the Soviet Union might have had 100 to 200 ICBMs. Um, but the, Stratcom, the, the Air Force Strategic Air Command, led by um, Curtis LeMay, who's the guy who firebombed and nuclear bombed Japan, he was telling the White House and others that the Soviet Union had might have a thousand ICBMs, and then Ellsberg finds out that the actual number is four, and that that changes his whole head because, like, he describes himself as quite a uh, militant Cold Warrior up until that point. He was a Cold Warrior from the beginning, as was his father, who was a lifelong Republican. Uh, and so Dan did think that the Soviet Union was the enemy and they had to be resisted. He initially thought that the threat of nuclear war did not come from the United States. The danger of nuclear war came from the Soviets. And so his initial strategy was how do we, what do we have to do to preempt a Soviet nuclear attack on the United States? So the missile gap is relevant in that context. And he discovers, as you say, that uh, the United States has 40, new, 40 ICBMs. The Soviets only have four initially. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the gap was even much vaster than that. So Dan discovers that early. And that's starting to change his thinking. And that original PSYOP that he studied, where the United States is going to launch everything and uh, lead to about 600 million deaths, you know, further reinforced his thinking on this. But that was Dan's initial interest was as a nuclear war planner. When he went to work for McNamara in the Pentagon in 64, you know, he started to work on Vietnam. But his real concern was with nuclear war and how to prevent nuclear war. And a lot of his concerns about Vietnam are again in the context of preventing nuclear war. Well, elaborate that. Well, it was interesting when I, the more studies I did on, on this period, uh, the scientists especially, the Chinese test their nuclear bomb in 1964. And so the American strategy in Vietnam is even back in 54, when the French were being defeated at the Dien Bien Phu, according to Operation Vulture, Nixon and John Foster Dulles offered the, the French three atomic bombs to use against the, the Vietnamese uh, at the Dien Bien Phu. In order okay, to okay, hold on. The Americans offer the French nuclear weapons and in other words, suggesting they should. Well, yes, the United States, uh, Nixon thought so, Eisenhower thought so, and Dulles thought so. Uh, but they wanted to get the agreement 
of Britain and France before they would do this. And the British and the French, fortunately, were much more rational than was uh, Eisen Eisenhower and Nixon at that point. You have to remember that Eisenhower's goal was to erase the line between nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. He said, this taboo is limiting what we can do. But American policy by 54, the New Look defense policy, was to rely on nuclear weapons as our first line of defense. This is one of the, the insanities of Eisenhower. Eisenhower was not a warmonger, he was not bloodthirsty, uh, but he did this policy uh, was a, a suicidal, or as Dan likes to say, an, an omnicidal policy. Uh, and we knew that from the mid 50s. That's why it's in 1955, that Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein issue their famous Einstein-Russell Manifesto. The last thing that Einstein ever signed was the letter to, to Bertrand Russell signing on to this manifesto. And what it says basically is that if there was a nuclear war and uh, London and New York and Moscow were wiped out, that within a few hundred years, the human species would recover. But the real danger in a nuclear war with hydrogen bombs is that all of humanity will be wiped out. And, and so that's their warning. They and uh, I think it was nine other leading physicists and philosophers around the world have signed off on this. And Dan, Dan was, you know, aware of this, uh, but thought that the real threat at that point was coming not from the United States, but from the Soviets, which he learns later is not the case. So, but Einstein's nuclear policies, it was back in 1947 that Lewis Mumford, Lewis Mumford wrote that editorial, that statement, gentlemen, you are mad, that, no, that these look like normal human beings going to the office, have with families and children and dressed in suits and ties with the name of president and secretary of defense and general. He says, and they go into the office and they carry out these plans for annihilation, for human extinction. They're madmen. You know, but but it's been rational people under with rational plans who seem like normal human beings who are bent upon this compulsion for mass extinction. And that's the craziness that, that Dan understood, that Dan has been campaigning against his entire life ever since, which makes him, you know, why we love him so much. <laughs> and when he releases the Pentagon Papers, his plan is to reveal all this insanity about nuclear strategy. And then the documentation gets wiped out in a hurricane because it was buried somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Dan had not only copied the Pentagon Papers, he had copied everything else that was top secret in his desk at Rand. And so he had thousands and thousands of pages on all of America's insane secret war plans, our nuclear war plans. Dan thought that after the Pentagon Papers crisis was over, he was going to then release all of the nuclear papers. And that was what he thought was even more important than the Pentagon Papers about the Vietnam War. But he knew that the FBI was going to come and arrest him uh, because of the Pentagon Papers leak. And so he gave these other papers to his brother, his brother Harry, an older brother. And his brother also realized that when Dan got arrested, he was they were going to come and search his place. And so he put them in a, a cardboard box inside of a green plastic garbage bag, then decided to bury them in the local dump. And he buried them under a, a, a stove uh, and so he could be identified where they were and pick and get them again when he was ready to. But then there was a tropical storm that summer and they, the, every, all of the things in that dump got re misplaced. Uh, the stove was 100 yards away from where it was originally, and they couldn't find the, uh, the, all the nuclear papers. Uh, and, uh, and they searched for a year and a half, and they got all kinds of digging machines and everything, and got thousands of bags, but not the right ones. And so Jesus. they never found it. They never found all these. Since then, fortunately, a lot of them, or some of them at least, have been released and declassified. And Dan, one of the things about Dan, he might not remember what you and he talked about yesterday, 
Yeah, right. He has a photographic memory of every document that he ever saw 60 years ago. And so in Dan's brilliance, you know, it came in number three in his class at Harvard. And Kissinger, who decries him, as you said, for being the most dangerous man in America, had publicly given him credit for having taught me more about Vietnam than any other living person. And that everybody recognizes Dan's brilliance. Uh, and going along with that is this precise photographic memory when it comes to all the things that happen and the documents. So he was able to recreate a lot of this over the years. And this ends up in his book, Doomsday Machine. And I should, for all transparency's sake, explain that I'm working with Dan on a documentary series on exactly that book, uh, on Doomsday Machine. Um, so how does a man who's a Marine, who's a cold warrior, who's, you know, life at, up until, you know, at this point is devoted within the military industrial complex. How does he get to a point where he releases the Pentagon Papers, is ready to release the nuclear secrets and willing to go to jail for it? Well, Dan had a, a, a deep uh, sense of morality, fortunately, for the world. And and he also had an abhorrence for lies, mendacity, and deception. He's really a Democrat, a small d Democrat, and believes that people and policymakers need to have access to information. Dan believes in transparency, believes in honesty, believes in decency, and has an abhorrence for war and killing. Uh, and uh, so when he saw that for example, when he, we're talking about Vietnam, he, um, he went to work in 1964. His first day at work for McNaughton uh, in the Pentagon was August 4th, 1964. And that was the day of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And he saw what was happening. And he saw that initially they thought there was an attack but as more and more intelligence came in, they realized that they, it was very dubious that there was any attack. Hey, Peter, for younger viewers that don't know what we're talking about, it's just a third 20 seconds on what the Gulf, and Tonk, Gulf of Tonkin incident was. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was uh, U.S. ships, two U.S. ships in these waters off the coast of Vietnam had allegedly come under attack and the belief from the North Vietnamese. And the belief was this was aggression on the part of North Vietnam, in response to which uh, the United States launched attacks on North Vietnam. This was August 4th, 1964. Uh, and, but it very quickly became clear that from the commander on board the USS ships there that they were, were all kinds of interference, uh, that, that they maybe were the things that they thought were an incoming attack were not an incoming attack. Uh, but we decided to launch this anyway. And, and McNamara and Johnson uh, issued a series of statements that were bald-faced lies about what had occurred that night. And as the intelligence was coming in, Dan realized beforehand that the, it was very, very dubious and that they were using this as a pretext for escalating, expanding the war in Vietnam. Uh, the, give it a, a little more context. The, uh, what, what, uh, what was Dan and, and McNaughton, his boss, were asked to come up with a series of statements uh, that were basically a series of lies that could be used in defense of American policy of aggression there. And that was Dan's first day and first night. He stayed up all night in the Pentagon working on this, following the incoming intelligence reports. So Dan was effect effectively shifted when he went to from McNaughton in August of 64 from the nuclear issues to Vietnam. And so he started to get all the intelligence reports. He asked for everything. 
and every day they would bring in a stack of reports taller than he was. So eight feet of reports, mostly top secret reports about what was going on in Vietnam. So Dan had a front row seat to the lying, the mendacity. You have to remember that during the Johnson administration, they developed the term called the credibility gap because Johnson would, you know, we, we talked about Trump and Trump's 7,000 lies, uh, seven plus thousand lies about everything. But Johnson might not have been quite the uh, pathological liar that Donald Trump was about everything. But when it came to Vietnam, uh, Johnson lied constantly. And among the, the things, and what Dan was discovering during these years, because he goes to Vietnam first in 1961, goes back to Vietnam in 1965. And there he's working for the infamous Ed Lansdale, the master counterinsurgent there. Uh, and, but, and he makes, becomes friendly with John Paul Van, who was a, much, was a very honest critic of the war. And Dan then is in charge of doing assessments of the pacification programs in the countryside. And he stays in Vietnam as a civilian until 1967, uh, when he gets hepatitis and has to return to the United States. So between the documents he was reading and then his on the ground experience, what Dan was learning firsthand was that what we were saying about the war and the reality of the war were two different things. Then in 67, Dan is asked to work on the Pentagon Papers, which was a secret study of the war from 1954, even earlier, up through 1968, that was commissioned by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Dan had worked through Rand on the first volume, uh, but they actually he actually got access to the entirety of this top secret documents that he stored in his safe at Rand. Uh, and so, so, but what Dan was learning over these years was that we were saying that the war is not only could we win the war, which was not true, but that we were winning the war. And for example, when Dan was in Vietnam, he met with McNamara, this was in 66, and he briefed McNamara. McNamara wanted to know what Dan was finding on the ground. And Dan told him that we were not, not only not winning, that we were losing ground, that if the best we could say was a stalemate, a quagmire, the worst was we were putting more and more troops in and getting nowhere. And McNamara agreed with him. And he said, the, the situation is worse. It's much worse than it was a year ago. Uh, and then McNamara gets off the plane, gets in front of the microphones, tells the press and the others who were there, we're winning the war. Things are improving. The conditions are getting better. Dan saw firsthand that kind of lying repeatedly, as did others. I mean, there was at least a thousand people, Dan says, who knew the reality was the opposite of what was being said. And so what was being said was we were winning, the reality we were not. And so when uh, Johnson talks about putting in another 25 or 50,000 troops, and he says, and that's all we have planned, the generals and Dan and others knew that they had plans to put in 150,000 more troops but they were lying to the American people. They were lying to the Congress and that this is not the way a democracy is supposed to work. And so Dan understanding the horrors of what we were doing, the futility of what we were doing, <clears throat> the immorality and the mendacity, Dan uh, knew he had to do something. So his thinking was changing. And he met Patricia, who was madly in love with, and Patricia was covering the war as a journalist and also helped influence Dan. And they went to anti-war marches together. Uh, and Dan knew that he had to act and figure out ways to act. So he told everybody he spoke to that, we're, that this is wrong, it's immoral, it's a lie, and we're actually not going to win and we should get out immediately. He was opposed to the bombing. He hated the thought of the bombing. He hated the troop escalation uh, and knew that this was a losing policy and we were lying to the American people. But then, uh, so then he works on the Pentagon Papers. And by 1969, he's at his wit's end about what to do 
to try to help end the war. And so Dan decides to copy the Pentagon Papers. This is two years before they were released. And then Dan tries to get them to congressmen, to senators. He tries to get to, to, to friendly people, to the Robert Kennedy he talks to. He wants Charles Mathias, uh, uh, Fulbright, other senators to get them to release this publicly, put it in the congressional record, go before the public and say that we've been lying and lying and lying, uh, but everybody's got their reasons for not doing it. So finally, Dan decides that the best way to do it is to go to the New York Times. And he contacts Neil Sheehan because he knew Neil from Vietnam. He knew that Neil was strongly opposed to the war. And so he trusted Neil Sheehan. Uh, and gave him access to, to these records, to the Pentagon Papers. Because what the Pentagon Papers showed is that administration after administration after administration had been lying about the, about the war and that the public didn't know this and much of Congress didn't know this. Dan, so when Dan thought that leaking the Pentagon Papers would probably not end the war, but it might help nudge the country in that direction. And so finally, even though Neil was playing, playing dirty and dishonest with, with Dan uh, about what the Times was planning, uh, the Times finally, I think it was June 13th, 1971, finally starts publishing the Pentagon Papers. They didn't even give Dan any warning that they were gonna do so, uh, which was very, very immoral. You know, Dan was, it was not hard to figure out that Dan was the likely source for this. The FBI was already on to him for this. Uh, and <clears throat> so Dan and Patricia go underground. Part of the story that's not very well known <clears throat> is that the papers were at times stored in Howard Zinn's living room in Boston that working with Dan to distribute them to the newspapers was my friend Gar Alperwitz who wrote the book Atomic Diplomacy, which really was one of the great books about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And Gar is still very, very active through the Democracy Collaborative and other things on nuclear issues and on economic transformation. So Gar is still out there doing great work, but his role in all this didn't come out till a couple of years ago. Uh, so they get it to the New York Times, the Times starts publishing it, uh, the Nixon administration freaks out and they get the Supreme Court to issue an injunction on the New York Times to halt publication. And so Gar then brings, gets them to the Washington Post. And then the Washington Post starts to publish. And then the Boston Globe, so they, then the Post is shut down and the Boston Globe, and then the Globe is shut down and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and they're shut down. Finally, 19... Sh sh shut down by injunction from the government, by the government, yeah. Stop the publication. Uh, they finally get it to 19 different newspapers that publish parts of this. Then the Supreme Court lifts the injunction and says that they do not have a right to stop the publication. Now, what, what's the historic significance of the release of the Pentagon Papers? And, and how much did it have an effect on uh, eventually ending the war? Well, it's interesting because Nixon and Kissinger freak out. And if you watch Oliver's movie, Nixon, it's got a lot of this. And they decide that they're going to destroy Dan Ellsberg. Right? Nixon says, I'm going to show, we're going to show him going to the bathroom in front of the American people and we're going to destroy him. And in those meetings there, Kissinger apparently mouthing Coulson talks about uh, different things about Dan, all these lies. But then he says that Dan Ellsberg is the most dangerous man in America, as you said in the introduction. Dan had known Kissinger at Harvard. He had lectured in Kissinger's classes a couple of times. Kissinger had tremendous respect for Dan. But Kissinger was such a slimy, you know, duplicitous, two-faced, lying, kind of power-hungry creep in all of this. Uh, and so they then they create the plumber's unit. The plumber's unit was set up to stop the leaks. And the leaks were coming from Dan initially. Uh, but it, it was the things that they did to Dan uh, 
that ultimately bring down the Nixon administration. So the plumbers unit, they also um, wiretapped Dan's phones illegally. They uh, broke into his psychiatrist Fielding, Dr. Fielding's office to get a comp more compromising material on Dan. They put a hit on Dan of 12 Cubans from the CIA who go back to the Bay of Pigs who were, who were told to compromise Dan uh, totally, to incapacitate him totally is what, the, what their, their objective was. Fortunately, they didn't get to him that day. Uh, but it was those things that ultimately brought down the Nixon administration. A lot of the other things in Watergate, Nixon could have probably defended himself against on national security grounds. But they found all of this other things. It was based upon that. So when the trial finally comes in 1973, Dan and Tony Russo faced 115 years in prison for what they had done under the Sedition Act of, or the Espionage Act of 1917, they prosecuted Dan. Uh, and he was facing 115 years of life sentence for trying to stop the Vietnam War. Uh, but it ultimately happens is this is what brings down the Nixon administration, which is fortunate because Nixon intended to restart the bombing. But because of the uh, Watergate investigation and scandal, he wasn't able to do so. And we were finally able to end that war, the American part of it in 1973, the overall war in 1975. The war, as you know, was horrific. Um, Robert McNamara came into my class. He said he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in the war. You know, and I, as I say, and I think you and I have discussed, um, and I, the, I ask my students, you know, what they know, and they don't know that much about it, but they have almost all been to the Vietnam Memorial walls. And those black stone walls, black granite walls, marble walls, um, they, two big walls, 492 feet long, have the names of 58,280 Americans who died in the war. The message of the Vietnam Memorial is that the tragedy of Vietnam is that 58,000 280 Americans died, 492 feet long. If those walls contain the names of all the Americans, all the 3.8 million Vietnamese, the more than a million Cambodians, Laotians, the Thais, the Brits, uh, the Aussies, everybody who died in that war, it would be more than eight miles long. And that's what should be the memorial to the Vietnam War. And that would be an anti-war memorial, like the o Okinawa Memorial, that has the names of everybody on all sides who died in the fighting in Okinawa. But the Americans are not quite there yet. But Dan was there. He saw the tragedy and was willing to risk his life in order to stop that war. Now, Dan is, as I said early on, is still as active as ever campaigning against the threat of nuclear war. And he says he thinks the threat is as dangerous now as ever. This idea that because the Cold War with the Soviet Union is over, somehow nuclear weapons aren't a threat anymore is a complete illusion that, that it's still very dangerous. So let's talk about the current situation, but start with the comment you made about Obama, that, that if Obama had been president during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we might, we might not be talking today. Well, the thing about Kennedy was that from the Bay of Pigs on, and Kennedy had been sort of a war hero in World War II in the Navy, uh, and after the Bay of Pigs, he refused to send reinforcements to back up to bomb in Cuba, and he had told them beforehand he wouldn't, but he got berated by top officials in the Pentagon, Lemnitzer, and the CIA, who thought that under that pressure, Kennedy would have to cave in and send in the military support for the, for the invading Cuban exiles and in, in CIA exiles in Vietnam, I mean, in, in Bay of Pigs, and he refused to do so. Uh, and, but after that, he developed this deep mistrust and he talks about later those CIA bastards and those Joint Chiefs sons of bitches uh, 
and he said, I'm gonna, the first advice I'm going to give my successor is don't trust the generals, even on military matters. They don't know what they're talking about. And he says at one point, if somebody comes in here and they want to talk to me about economic policy or on insurance issues, uh, he says, I have no trouble contradicting them. But you assume that the military and the intelligence people have the superior knowledge and insight. They don't. You can't trust them even on these things. So Kennedy had a deep mistrust. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was often the only one in the room who resisted bombing and invading Cuba. And that's why I'm saying that Obama, who's not, I'm not saying Obama's a bad guy or was bloodthirsty. Uh, it is bizarre that he won the Nobel Peace Prize while fighting two wars and bombing multiple other countries. Uh, but Obama just never stood up to the generals that way. Obama just did not have the backbone. Obama gave in time and time again, even though he knew, I'm sure, that this was a mistake. But what, what Dan and, uh, and I and, and, and Noam, perhaps more than anybody, have been making an issue of, uh, well, our friend Steve in Missouri, uh, also is that what's existed, we've known since 1983, but the reality is since 1950 or 52, probably, that we've been living with the threat of a nuclear winter. And that Sagan and the other scientists publicized this in 1983. And they talked about what would happen in the event of nuclear war, in which the cities would burn. And the cities would burn and that would send up millions of tons of smoke and soot into the stratosphere if it was in the troposphere, they would get washed away. But in the stratosphere, they wouldn't. And within weeks, it would circle the entire globe and soon block 70% of the sun's rays from hitting the earth. The temperatures on the earth would plummet. Uh, agriculture would be destroyed. We have about a 60-day stockpile of food around the world. And after that, the starvation and the disease would begin. And that... Um, Perhaps not everybody on earth would be killed, but over a period of years, probably 90 to 99% of people on earth would perish as a result of what we call nuclear winter. And Dan and I have been working with people to advance these studies now. And what we realize now is that the, if anything, the threshold for nuclear winter that Sagan and others were talking about back in the 1980s was too low. That even though there were scientists paid by the, by the defense contractors and others who tried to deprecate and deny the theory of nuclear winter at that point, say, well, maybe it's only nuclear autumn and it's exaggerated and not everybody would die. Uh, the same kind of attacks that, that by quote unquote scientists against carcinogenic effects of nicotine, and the effects on the ozone layer, that we see now about climate change, uh, the same kind of lying refutations happened in the 1980s against nuclear winter. But scientists have begun doing those studies again. And what the recent studies show is that the risk is even greater than we realize. The recent studies show that a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, in which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, that that limited nuclear war, which would uh, kill up to 2 billion people all over the planet because of partial nuclear winter. And we know the reality is not that there are 100 nuclear weapons. There are more, there were close to 14,000 nuclear weapons left. And they're not Hiroshima size. They're between seven and 70 times the power of the Hiroshima bombs. So we know that we're lucky. And this is what Dan has been warning about more eloquently than anybody this idea that we're still living with the insanity, with the threat of annihilation, with the doomsday machine that we've created. And that if we created it, we can dismantle it. We've gotten rid of 80% of nuclear weapons, maybe more than that. But the United States and Russia have more than 90% of the existing arsenal. And that many of them, a couple thousand of them, are pointed at each other on hair trigger alert. And that that's the first sign, step of the insanity. Get rid of those intercontinental ballistic missiles. Stop the planning for a new generation of intercontinental ballistic missiles to replace the Miniman 3.
Dan wants to do that. He wants to get rid of no first the no first use of the first use policy and replace it with no first use. Obama has was supporting no first use back in 2013 and and did want to eliminate America's first use policy, but he got pushback. And he got pushed back from our NATO allies. He got pushed back from countries like Poland. And he was said, well, if we get rid of uh, first use, then Japan's going to develop its own nuclear weapons and Poland's going to develop their own nuclear weapons. And so we can do it. And again, Obama didn't stand up and fight for that. So, you know, Obama was a, a decent guy in a lot of ways and knew better. He just did not have the backbone of a Kennedy when when push came to shove it at that kind of crunch time. Uh, and, and now Biden, you know, as much as I admire much of what Biden is doing when it comes to domestic policy and, and his lab, pro-labor stand uh, and, and some of his economic policies and his new infrastructure plan might not be as big as I would like or his pandemic plan, but he's on the right track on these things. When it comes to foreign policy, he's sadly, I think, on a very, very dangerous track right now. And there's a new nuclear arms race, the, the Americans, the Russians, and now the Chinese, apparently. Uh, a, a whole new generation of nuclear weapons, uh, at least a trillion dollars being spent by the U.S. and Russia. And one expects that China, which has been a bit more moderate on these issues, may not continue to be so. And, and we're back into the crazy uh, nuclear weapons uh, race with all the promise or possibility of accidents, never mind deliberate use. And that was Obama's plan. That was the corrupt bargain that Obama made. Uh, and he authorized a trillion dollar modernization program over 30 years. That, that it's been reported that Biden was opposed to, but there's not a pipsqueak out of the Biden administration now of undoing it. No, and, and then during Obama's time, they estimated it was at least 1.2 trillion. Now the estimate is that it's gonna cost at least 1.7 trillion. And the craziness is that it's not just the U.S., that every single nuclear power, all nine, are modernizing their nuclear arsenals to make them more efficient and more deadly. Now, by more efficient means single weapons can kill more people. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> no, it's not a, it's not a laughing out of fun. I think it's funny. It's laughing out of desperation, you know, we're, we're help, we feel helpless sometimes and we laugh. But we, we look at what's happening. March 1st, 2018, Vladimir Putin announces his new, in his new, in his State of the Nation address, he announces that Russia now has five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent American missile defense. After the U.S. abrogated the ABM Treaty back in 2003, the Russians began, and they now finally have succeeded. And we've got all kinds of crazy new weapons that the U.S. has, Russia has, China has, hypersonic glide vehicles, new kinds of cruise missiles, torpedoes, underwater torpedoes that can blow up ports, coastal cities. I mean, it's getting more and more insane is what we're having. And you mentioned China. Um, China has a relatively small arsenal. China understands that 200 to 300 nuclear weapons is a sufficient deterrent to wipe out humanity, to wipe out, to wipe out the United States and, and every place else who might ever need to, that you don't need 10,000 or 4,000 or 1,000 nuclear weapons. There's a scene in Blazing Saddles where the sheriff is, has a prisoner, a, white, a black sheriff has a white prisoner, and he's surrounded by a hostile crowd and he takes the gun and puts it up to his own head and says, if you take one more step, I'm going to shoot. The thing is, that's almost the way nuclear winter works. You don't even have to hit, like Chinese don't have to hit the United States. They just have to threaten to blow themselves up and it's the end of the human race. Yeah, and none of, none of this is getting through in terms of the media. And none of it's getting through in terms of the Biden administration really either. Um, you know, when, when, when Biden is being asked, how am I, how is he going to pay for his new trillion dollar infrastructure plan? Well, one good way to start would be to cut the, the, the Pentagon budget in half and the Department of Energy budget in half. Well, there's a bill that uh, Senator Markey and Representative uh, Ro Kahana have introduced uh, 
to stop this new ICBM uh, development and put it into COVID relief. I mean, that's at least that's a, a creating a conversation, but you wouldn't know much of it. The mainstream media has barely covered the fact that they've introduced this bill. Or, or the discussion that we've had in recent years about th that no single person, you know, right now, Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden have the power to end life on the planet. I mean, they both have their own doomsday machines and they both can trigger nuclear holocaust. Um, and nobody should have that power. Actually, within Russia, he's got to get sign off before he would launch from, I think, two other people. But Biden technically doesn't. If Biden gives the order to launch a nuclear attack now, uh, nobody can stand in the way. Nobody can stop that. And that is pretty crazy, too. But the sad reality, and we don't know for sure, but we, we're pretty sure, is that there are other people, again, with their finger on the nuclear button. One of the things that Dan warned about in the 60s is that there were no locks on nuclear weapons. So even though people might not have had the authority, every submarine commander had the power to wipe out the Soviet Union. Uh, pilots had the power to launch themselves. We see the strange love scenario it's where a rogue, crazy general launches against the Soviet Union. That was the reality. We don't begin to put the locks on weapons in Europe until much later. And, and I gave a talk, which I'm talking about this. And uh, finally, somebody from the audience, one of the generals comes up afterwards and says that he used to Ha, uh, carry the nuclear, uh, uh, the, the nuclear football. And by the 1980s, we finally did put locks on submarine launched uh, mm -hmm. missiles. Uh, so, but for decades there, there was no, people could, could do this even if they didn't have the authority technically to do it. And we think that there has to be redundancy now, that if people are out of touch with the White House, we, other people can still launch without the president's authorization or right. what happens when Reagan gets shot during that time. I mean, certainly uh, others can, George H.W. Bush could, could have launched during that time. Well, for any of the viewers watching that haven't seen the movie Dr. Strangelove, go watch it right away. And no, because this is out of Dan's book, The Doomsday Machine, that when Dan and a friend of his went to see the movie, they came out and one of them turned to the other and said, did we just see a documentary? Because they actually believed that the scenario was really quite possible. Um, and then definitely everybody go out and get Dan's book, The Doomsday Machine. It's, it's a compelling read, chilling. And for me, one of the most important books I've ever read, because I was like everybody else. I was in uh, nuclear war denial. <laughs> you know, I, I could get climate and this and that, but nuclear war seems so abstract. Uh, when you read that book, it won't seem so abstract anymore. Anyway, thanks very much uh, for joining us, Peter, and happy birthday, Dan. Happy birthday, and, Dan. And uh, thanks for joining me on the analysis.news. Don't forget the donate button and all the rest.